natua na chapo wa slam alikuwa bado analia my sister no she she she's not that type to to have enemies there are certain people who have testified and i would feel that they actually say the truth there are people who are very honest in this country her friendliness her frankliness they she should tell you something straight without lying to you i never heard her shout i never heard her laugh out loud but she had this good smile it was shocking i was watching the news when i heard about it and at first i I thought they were talking about a different Mercy until they showed the picture then I realized it was the Mercy who was used to be my student. The public inquest into Mercy Kano's murder comes to an end in the near future. The prosecution has lined up more than 60 witnesses, the bulk of them being police officers. Tonight on Case Files, we walk back to a senior apartment where it all started and end on the highway where the investigations began. July 18th, 2011, a traffic police officer is called to attend to an accident scene along Waiyaki Way. The police officer records the details of the accident scene in his diary. The police officer pens in his statement, a female adult with a broken skull, fractured legs and hands lying near the edge of the road. The victim, the police officer says, has no shoes on. The police officer extends his search further. He walks several meters away from the body in an effort to try and locate the actual scene of the accident. Going back to where the body is lying, the police officer notices that there is no blood. He further discovers that the upper part of the victim's skull is missing, so is her brain. No more hit and run accidents have blood stains in notes, and the victim will normally have some personal effects on him or her. I was told that the the dean of men was looking for me. So I I went to the men's dorm. I was wondering what what is it? What are, what have I done? The dean of men is calling me. So uh, I just went with my husband. We went we went into the office. Then the the dean of students came. And he had just arrived in Baraton. He was still new. So he was like this is the first thing he's come to Baton and the first task he has is very painful for him. So um I looked at him you know in the back of my mind I said something terrible has happened. Faith had no idea that the body of her sister had been discovered along Waiyaki Way hours after she reportedly overpowered her niece and ran away from a house party. I was standing with her sister Faith Kaino on campus just somewhere near the university amphitheater and a friend sent me a text RIP Masi Kaino I looked at Faith the sister we were having a conversation a normal conversation on a normal day then I didn't know whether to tell her or not to tell her. I didn't know how to react. Masi Kaino had gone for an evening party with her niece a day earlier, but did not return home. I wanted to hear it from him for anything. So I I just sat and waited for him to talk. And he said that um Masi had an accident and she died i i broke down 
and cried. As traffic police officers moved the body of the University of Nairobi student to a city mortuary, a motorist showed up at Parklands police station. The lady motorist had a disturbing report to make. Lucina Mithayo Wanjeri told the police that at around 3 a.m., two hours before the body of Masi was discovered by the police along Waiyaki Way, she came across two vehicles, slowed down and noticed an object beneath a motor vehicle that resembled a human body. Lucina told the police she saw two legs rolling under the motor vehicle. She drove on. But before leaving the scene, she noticed the motor vehicle speeding off at high speed. Suspicious, she scribbled the motor vehicle's registration, told the police that indeed he was near the scene of the accident that morning. But he did not run over the body lying near the edge of the road. When asked why he never cared to report the incident to the police, the businessman said he saw no need to. Masi Kano's journey to a mysterious death started over to a senior apartment on the night of the 17th of July, 2011. I miss her company. Masi was among a group of 19 people. Charles Gidinji, the caretaker of the luxury apartments, paints a picture of a calm evening before it turned into a chaotic night. Charles says was in the apartment had 15 women and four men that night. Charles says around midnight the rest of the guests left the premises. It was summoned by the then Juja member of parliament William Kabogo. He says Kabogo wanted the caretaker to let him in to a house in the compound. The caretaker says Kabogo was in the company of two women. Kabogo ordered for two glasses of wine and two bottles of water. The caretaker says he came across two bodyguards trying to calm down Masi Keino. At the time, Masi had broken a glass and an empty bottle. The caretaker says at some point Masi ran towards the gym area. She was brought back by the security guard and she was forced to sit at the security gatehouses. According to the caretaker, moments later another lady came and spoke to Masi. Masi then accompanied the lady upstairs to a room. Charles says he was one of the people who escorted Masi Keino to the room. The sound of glasses breaking forced Charles to call two bodyguards and ask them to accompany him to where the sound of the commotion was coming from. Charles says the door to the room was closed when they got to eat and on knocking, William Kabogo opened. Masi was seated on the floor. There was a broken picture frame. I slapped like three slaps. Yeah, okay, so where's the count? Several slaps. Yeah, several slaps. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, how many hits on the joints? I didn't find Okay, The caretaker says Kabogo instructed his bodyguards to escort Masi out of the room. The bodyguards carried Masi on their shoulders. Okay, bodyguard, Hangi wezapo 
It is not clear why the bodyguards decided to carry Masi Kane on their shoulders. Was Masi too drunk to walk on her own or was she badly injured to stand on her feet? To questions that have since evaded police investigators. Charles says minutes later he had the member of parliament inquiring from one of his aides about Masi Kano's whereabouts. The aide told the member of parliament Masi had run off while they were trying to call a taxi for her. A guard with a local security firm will later tell the police that two bodyguards and scholar sticker Kamemba, Masi Kano's niece requested him to open the main gate to a senior apartment. Reason? They wanted to escort a drunk Masi Kano out of a senior apartment. The guard says he opened the gate for the three and that 15 minutes later, the bodyguards and Scholastica Kamemba returned and informed the guard that Masi and Scholastica Kamemba appeared before police officers at Parkland's police station. She told the police investigators that she was invited to the evening party by a second year student at the University of Nairobi. Kola, she was fondly referred to told the police that Mas was taking wine, but at some point she was mixing up drinks. She was running all over the house and at times she was breaking up things. In fact, she says at some point Masi cut her lip after she fell on the floor in the house. Scholar Sticker does not mention the private room where, according to the caretaker, Marcy had ended up after she brought her back from the main gate where she had run to. In her initial statement, the police scholar Sticker Kamemba says Marcy was very, very drunk. This was after she was asked to take her home. Witnesses in the Marcy Kano murder were recalled to Parkland's police station several times to record what police investigators term further statements. The statement taking so many of them advance various theories. Case files takes a short break.